Welcome to the SIBO Doctor Podcast with Dr. Narala Jacoby. If you're a practitioner and want to learn the basics of SIBO, head over to SIBOtest.com and sign up as a practitioner. This will give you access to a free 90-minute webinar on the fundamentals of SIBO treatment. If you're a patient, please know this information is not intended to diagnose or treat a medical condition. Please ask your doctor before initiating any new treatments. And now, over to Dr. Jacoby and the SIBO Doctor Podcast. If you're like me, you're finding that treating small intestinal bacterial overgrowth can be complicated. Patients often present with a myriad of symptoms and associated conditions which require holistic thinking and a methodical approach to treatment. This podcast was born out of a desire to start a conversation with other practitioners, educators, experts, and researchers, and see if their insights can give us new treatment considerations, especially for our difficult cases. In this podcast series, our guests talk about functional gut disorders, hormonal issues, the enteric nervous system, food intolerances, the immune system, the microbiome, methylation and genomic issues, and everything else that can make a SIBO case very confusing. I believe that by understanding the often complex interconnection of SIBO with other disease manifestations, we can be more effective in our treatment approaches. I hope you find this podcast useful in your practice, and thank you for listening. Welcome SIBO practitioners to another episode of the SIBO Doctor podcast. And with me today is Chris Gebhardt who works at Resonance Complementary Therapies in Melbourne, Australia, and has been uh, working with SIBO for three to four years, so quite some time. And he's graduated from the Southern School of Natural Therapies in 1995. He's a naturopath, but also an acupuncturist, um, and has done postgraduate studies in Japanese acupuncture. He works with his partner, Natalie Cruttenden, who they both are becoming quite famous in the Australian SIBO <laughs> circles. So I'm really happy to be talking to Chris. He's super brilliant. He's um, the, the man who sort of first mentioned pomegranate as a herbal treatment for, um, uh, for SIBO to me a few couple years ago. And I started to use it about a year ago now and getting really interesting results. And so, uh, but Chris, today we're, what we'll talk about is sort of the topic of constipation and how can we help our patients that have this real recalcitrant, not moving, nothing is moving sort of type of constipation. And uh, we know that's usually methane dominant related in terms of SIBO, but sort of, you know, tell me uh, what your experience with that is. And well, first of all, before I go into that, how, how did you get into SIBO? <laughs> sure. <clears throat> well, thank you for that um, <laughs> that intro. Very kind. Um, I I guess it's a little bit hazy now for me to, to work out exactly when it started. <clears throat> but we, um, I guess I, I probably came to it through, uh, it was first mentioned at a metagenic seminar that we attended probably about four years ago, the idea of SIBO. Um, prior to that, I'd been treating patients for irritable bowel syndrome with, you know, mixed success and um, um, kind of got interested in that that whole idea of, you know, bacterial overgrowth in the small bowel because I think a lot of the therapies that we'd been using had been mostly targeting uh, the large intestine and, and probably upper digestion and missing that kind of important middle bit. And we were doing CDSAs and you know, trying to, uh, I heard some people trying to extrapolate ideas about bacterial overgrowth in the small intestine based on information they were reading on CDSAs. So I looked into that a little bit and um, <laughs> I'm not sure that you can do that. But um, yes, I started treating patients um, and kind of winging it a little bit using some antimicrobials and, um, and restricting diet, you know, lower fermentable foods, which was still very vague at that time. And um, and then uh, we came across yourself, and uh, that was quite a pivotal moment for my practice, certainly, and also Natalie's. And um, that 
as soon as I heard that, it was sort of a light bulb moment for me, you know, this idea that we could treat it effectively. And also, you know, it had, it had sort of tied together a whole lot of loose ends. And, um, you know, it's still it's still an area that's growing and, and developing and, and is can be very frustrating, but re- very rewarding at the same time. But certainly the clarity that I got from from your initial podcast, um, or I think it was a seminar, there was a webinar that we listened to, um, we went straight in and started using, you know, the biphasic diet. And that was a game changer. So yeah. Oh, great. That's good to hear. Really good to hear. Um, yeah, it's been something, you know, <clears throat> that's been on our radar for quite some time. But as I always mention, it's sort of flabbergasting that it's such a major condition. And we really just started to hear about it six years ago in our sort of comp- um, integrative medicine circles, naturopathic circles. So it's come leaps and bounds, there's heaps of research, and it's great to see the the interest that is uh, generated also in the public who's been looking for answers for a long time. So this is mm. really, it's very good. So let's go into um, constipation, right? What we know <laughs> is typically with uh, long-standing SIBO patients that are methane dominant, we see this type of constipation that doesn't always resolve just with treating the methane. What are you seeing in your practice when it comes to um, overcoming or helping patients overcome this kind of constipation, even if methane levels are dropping? Yeah. So it has been a a really big challenge. Um, I, I, for some reason, I don't know if it's just Melbourne or myself, but I do attract mostly methane positive (laughs) patients, which has been quite frustrating um, because it's, as you know, as a practitioner, it's the most challenging part. Um, It hasn't always been that way, but I actually thought it was the easier part to treat until we lost a, um, one of our major weapons against it. Um, but since then, we've been scrambling to try and find things that, you know, help reduce the methane levels and follow up tests. And, um, you know, that's still a work in progress. Um, but I, what I will say is that certainly given that I do see lots of patients with methane dominance, in fact, they are the dominant SIBO patient that I see. Um, there's often, um, you know, whether it's stealing all the hydrogen and, and masking, um, you know, the hydrogen producers as well, or, you know, just uh, methane, you know, the methanobacter by itself. Um, either way, those patients, there's a, I, I think the thing about treating SIBO, I'll just mention first, um, that I found is that no two SIBO patients are the same. So mm-hmm. um, even though, and, and no two constipation seem to be the same as well. So I think, you know, I've found certainly that there've been, and, and I'll talk a little bit about some of the things that I use in my practice, but Often with patients, I'm I'm using multiple agents and and trying multiple things, and and sometimes it just works brilliantly, and other times it'll be working brilliantly for a while, and then for whatever reason it it changes, um, and then. But what I have noticed is that um, after we we do manage to get the the um, the methane and hydrogen levels down to manageable levels, um, the 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 work that we do after that tends to make the biggest progress on the um, on the constipation. So that's an area that I find interesting because I think even though we're talking about small intestine, we're actually, you know, it can't be really separated from, you know, the larger gut. And I think, you know, definitely people who have EBO um, are having dysfunction and imbalance in their large intestine, which will also predispose them to having constipation. And um, I don't know how clearly you can separate those two. So, but certainly I find in my practice that it seems to be that when we're treating SIBO and doing the active antimicrobial phase, that most patients need extra support uh, to help stimulate the bowel during that time. Mm, I found that as well. And one of the things I always explain to my patients is that the, the bowel, the peristaltic action in the large intestine has been stagnant for so long that those kind of stretch receptors, well, there's actually two parts to this. And one is that obviously on the biphasic diet, um, you're, you're reducing fibers. So meaning that the bulk of the stool will be lessened, meaning that those receptors in the colon aren't going to be stimulated just by stretch, by stretching out because the lack of the fiber Mm. as much. 
And then also, um, you know, we, we usually add in the antimicrobials in the hopes of methane. Uh, if it's purely methane and we get it down, that that will stimulate the bowel or that uh, peristaltic action will be initiated again because you're no longer having the freezing action of the uh, of methane on the bowels. So, but you know, in my experience, and I'm curious to hear what you have to say about that, is mm. it's about maybe, I'm gonna just take a stab here, but maybe only as much as maybe 20, 30% of methane dominant patients that will improve solely or it, their constipation will improve solely by reducing methane. So yes. I completely agree with you that we need other secondary support to help with re-stimulating and resetting the bowel peristalsis in the large intestine. Yeah, definitely. Um, and and I, I think, you know, for me, the, the treatment during the, the active phase, which is what I call the antimicrobial phase, is is you know that's why it is if you stop that things can get really uh, complicated as well and i think the other thing about constipation is that even though the you may be getting improvement in reducing um you know quantities of the methanobacter or or the hydrogen producing organisms whichever they be sometimes if i've, I've had a few cases where my patients have such chronic constipation that it's it would it's almost impossible to read whether the the progress you're making with with you know the antimicrobials is actually you know doing anything at all because the you know symptoms that can come right back if the the bowels are so clogged up i mean we've had patients who have had ct scans because they've had nausea that had returned and um constant um you know issues with the upper digestive system and found that they had been totally clogged and it was only until they started, you know, taking some fairly industrial strength um, laxatives that a lot of their symptoms um, improve. And, you know, that, that that's an extreme case. But I think also if the bowels aren't moving, you know, there is obviously going to be fermentation in the large bowel, which is going to make them feel very uncomfortable and bloated as well. So mm -hmm. it, it does make it very tricky. And I, I, I do try as a priority to try and make sure that um, patients have regular bowel move as regular as we can during the the tr active treatment phase as a result of that because it makes it gives for greater greater clarity to understand what's doing what mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah so what additional and actually before i go into that i just want to also clarify that uh for the uh practitioners listening is when we get a SIBO test result or breath test result i should say um and we see uh, a, a methane that is high on baseline but stays high, doesn't really rise more than 12 parts per million, we're now considering, and this is uh, a growing body of practitioners and gastroenterologists are thinking that that's actually reflective of what we now call IBSC or a constipative type of IBS that's not really SIBO. With SIBO, we really do want to see that rise of uh, methane indicating hydrogen involvement in the first 100 to 120 minutes uh, so that we see that fermentation in the small intestine. So I often, when I see this high baseline that stays high, now really will also immediately, or not immediately, but will consider using large intestinal support from the get-go because they have uh, both, uh, both section involved. Do you, mm. would you agree with that? Yeah, totally. Yeah. And I think it was an interesting thing because I do see a lot of that um, where, you know, you can have levels of even up to 40 or 50 as mm -hmm. a baseline. So, and then, you know, just it's it's like a, a straight line down where, you know, you're getting, you know, it pretty much stays the same or there's some fluctuations in those methane levels, but certainly very high levels. And um, and they are typically the patients that I'm talking about with that, mm -hmm. you know, really recalcitrant concentra uh, constipation. And those are the patients that I, yes, I do also start working on the large intestine as well. Um, right. And I think otherwise, you know, it makes it very tricky to get anywhere. So give yep. us your secrets, Chris. What do you, <laughs> what do you find effective? Well, yeah, so it's an interesting one. I, I as I said earlier, a lot of the, the real progress is made um, in what I call the repair phase, which is when, you know, the SIBO has, has certainly been you know largely dealt with to the point where they're feeling much more comfortable but they still have constipation so but during the the treatment phase i have found to be successful 
And this also changes, as I mentioned earlier as well, but um, I do use Prescript Assist a lot. And I don't know what your personal experience is like with that, but I have found for some people that is like magic for moving bowels. And um, so I do use that. Um, the other thing that I do use, and this is another one that can go, can backfire and, and actually cause constipation, um, which is the partially hydrolyzed guar gum. Mm-hmm. So I do use quite a lot of that in my practice, and for some people it's 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 a game changer, and for others it's it's something they never want to take again. Um, so they're two uh, two important ones. Um, I do use a lot of uh, herbal based laxatives as well. Um, so I, I use the Metagenics Laxatone, or sometimes the uh, Mediherbs Cascara Complex. Um, I find also that that can be a bit tricky because. Some people will, will will be okay for a little bit and then suddenly they'll require, you know, many more capsules than they were taking to get a, a good bowel movement. And then it may go to diarrhea. So it can be very tricky trying to get the balance right with that. Mm. Um, I do, yes? Uh, yeah, so I was just going to uh, make some comments on the prescriptuses. It's a yep. real hit and miss for me too. It's all on, sort of fallen out of favor because the, the, the times that I do see this kind of like, wow, uh, moments has really it's not that often so yep. I now go more to the uh, bifidobacterium lactis HN 019 uh, yep. which is a, a particular probiotic strain that has been shown to increase peristaltic action and yeah occasionally I use mutaflor um, yep. in terms of just probiotics mutaflor is a beneficial e coli so those two do uh, you know that like I'm starting to see, I'm, I've been using a lot more of the Bifidobacterium lactis, and that's either ProBioMax, um, and I think uh, the Orthoplex Multigen has it in it as well, if I'm not mistaken. So I, I, yep, that's yep. Yeah. And I was going to say that that's the other thing that I do use quite a oh, lot. Great. Of the the yeah. Zymage ProBioMax Plus, which are sachets. And this. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that has been good. Um, the other thing that <clears throat> has certainly been a real asset. Um, and I, I tend not to introduce this in the early phase of treatment, but I have been using it much more. And that's the Bioceuticals Ultrabiotic 500. Mm-hmm. So like a sledgehammer. <laughs> <laughs> does, that have the, the, does, does, does that have the Bifidolactis in it? I, I don't know off the top of my head. I can't yeah. remember. But, um, but, but you're getting good reason, results with that. That's good to know. Yeah, it's been absolutely brilliant, and um, it's it's consistent uh, across the board. So I, I do usually start people because there's, they've got their one week intensive program. I think they've decided to come after antibiotic use. So, mm-hmm. and some of my mm-hmm. patients who I am using antibiotics with, um, for those patients who I can't help with the herbal based antimicrobial approach, I am referring off. Uh, particularly with the methane for uh, prescription of neomycin. I don't like to do it, but mm-hmm. um, it works. And, mm-hmm. and then I make sure that we follow up and do, there's a lot of repair work that goes on in the large bowel after that. Mm-hmm. Well, um, you know, and just one other comment about uh, partially hydrolyzed guar gum. I am seeing, uh, you know, sort of a, also a, hit, a bit of a hit and miss in terms of constipation. Mm. Um, yep. And it is more of a water soluble uh, fiber, so I think less of a bulking agent uh, yeah. than so, and sometimes you know, if I see patients that have a, a methane that stays high, I'm not shying away from things like trying flax seeds or chia seeds because you know those are more again as I've mentioned before, if we're not seeing that rise in methane indicating yeah. less fermentation in the upper gut, I yeah. you know I do think that the diet can be too uh too sort of meat oriented and and sort of constipating by nature so yep. i try to bulk it up a bit more and with the hydrolyzed guar gum i do sometimes start like my experience with that has been that you have to start sometimes just wetting your finger and putting it into the fiber you know like titrating yep. it up yep. is definitely the way to go rather than a whole scoop um, with meals and stuff like that. So that's yeah. been my experience with that. But it's, yeah. I also use sometimes uh, turkey rhubarb um, or okay. just rhubarb in if I make up a liquid tincture. Uh, and then also bowel retraining in terms of, you know, having an, an easy stool 
those kinds of simple things of having um, a little bit of an elevation uh, by the toilet. And for those listening that don't know what I'm talking about, it's basically <laughs> like a little stool that goes around the toilet so that um, patient can put their feet on the stool and putting them in a better anatomical squatting position. And many people find that to be helpful, especially if there's a bit of a, a collapsed sort of rectum and really lazy colon. And sometimes when you get uh, the colonoscopy reports and they say it's an extra long colon, which just means they lost the haustration in the large intestine. And especially I find that really helpful for those patients where you are really have lost the tone of the large intestine. And that's those, those are, I find are the, the trickiest patients because mm -hmm. you're going to have to use substances that may not be uh, indicated as much for SIBO and things like that. So, but um, ha have you done anything with like coffee enemas, anything like that? No. No? <laughs> I, yeah, <laughs> I don't, I, I have no affinity for enemas and um, personally or for prescribing. And um, I haven't, I haven't seen any, you know, overwhelming information that would suggest that for me that that's the way to go. How about you? I do recommend it sometimes for the reason that um, the coffee can actually sort of, if they have some sort of nerve uh, receptor issue, sort of fatigue almost, where those receptors have not been stimulated for a while, then um, the coffee can actually help to re I'll use the word tonify, which is very unscientific, but it tends to, uh, it te like, you know, I mean, I, I was trained in hydrotherapy in my training way back when in, in Bastyr, and we had, I mean, physical therapies and hydrotherapy was a big part. And we did talk a lot about colonics and the clinic I worked in in Montana, we, we did do colonics and I've seen absolutely miracles. Uh, with professional colonics in terms of, uh, you know, even just arresting acute asthma attacks and things like mm. that. So so I have a high comfort level, but I, I teach my patients how to do it correctly, and I don't recommend it for every patient. And I understand the the concern why you wouldn't, and especially with SIBO cases, we always talk about, well, we don't want any backflow into the small intestine in people that have open ICVs or ileocecal yep. valves, but with an enema, you're really not going to get that high, you know? Yep. So, and it's also just instant relief for a lot of people. So I yep. do use it fairly frequently with those that have very, very stuck bowels. Um, yep. And just for a short period of time, maybe a month, every other day, uh, or, um, or, or or twice a week or something like that, just to kind of mm. help move things out. Because sometimes when you use cascara or the laxatone, they can be kind of crampy because they're yep. so impacted, you know. So that's been my experience. But yeah. that's been so really helpful, though, for like to hear your view on that. So what were yeah, you going to say? Uh, so I was just going to say there's a few things you touched on. And I, as a physical therapist, I do a lot of abdominal work. Um, that's a big part of my practice, mm. and I, I do a uh, kinesiology test, some of the sphincters of the abdomen, mm. and I will always treat those where they show up, and I do follow-ups whenever my patients return back to the clinic, and test whether they have remained open or uh, function, or you know, functioning well, and so that's that's a big part. Um, I do abdominal massage, um, I do acupuncture, um, I do whatever I can <laughs> to help with that. Mm -hmm having to, you know, to resort to, you know, more industrial methods. methods. Um, the other I have a thing question is, about that, actually. Can I just interject? Because yeah. I have a, sure. I have a, I'm really curious about that because I don't do that. So when you do this kind of, because I have a visceral manipulation person I refer to that does this mm. type of sphincter work. So yeah. what's your, um, do you feel like there are, is a particular type of patient with constipation that will respond really well to that? And like you see better, um, but you see less constipation in those patients? Um, I'm not sure that I can answer that. I haven't, I haven't noticed any correlation, but I, because I test every single patient mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and it can go either way, you know, if it's overstimulated, it'll, it'll irritate and cause mm -hmm. more of a loose bowel movement as well, which is why, you know, coffee can aggravate people sometimes mm -hmm. is that mm -hmm. stimulation of the IC valve. Um, yeah, so that's, I, I yeah. I'm not, and I'm not doing it by itself as well. I'm usually 
doing it as as a part of a whole abdomen treatment. Um, yeah, so I'm not mm-hmm. I'm not sure if I can okay. answer that one. All right. Yeah, but I did want to mention also that the I think the that thing that goes around the toilet is known as a squatty potty. <laughs> <laughs> squatty potty. But, but Mine is called be... an easy stool. Oh, is it? Okay, yeah. There you go. <laughs> Ease the stool. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, there's also I. I have a recipe that I do use, and it's interesting that you mentioned that you do use uh, chia seeds and linseeds and things, which I I am using more and more um, in those patients as well, particularly where that methane is high across the um, the whole course of the testing. Um, and I, it's a combination of seeds that is just brilliant for moving bowels, and it has, I'll list the ingredients now, it's uh, chia seeds, it has linseeds, uh, pumpkin seeds, sunflower seeds, uh, and also has some almond in it. And yeah, so that's, they're the mains, but I get people to grind them up into a meal and, uh, we usually start slowly and build up. And, and obviously if people have known sensitivities to taking either chia or linseeds, which are two that I find that can aggravate. Um, we tend to leave those out, but Otherwise, they're usually um, building up to uh, two tablespoons a day, and you get them to sprinkle that on their cereal or um, or whatever they're having, even vegetables. Uh, depends on what at what phase they're at in the treatment. Um, and, and those also, are equal parts. Yeah, equal parts. Mm-hmm. Just I usually get them to do small quantities so that they're not having um, you know ground nuts and seeds exposed mm-hmm. to oxygen for longer than they need to be, and they keep mm-hmm. it in an airtight container in the fridge or the freezer. Mm. The other thing it, it works really nicely for is to uh, crumb chicken or fish or yeah other proteins. Oh, that's a great tip. I'm yeah. a, it's like a like a fiber schnitzel. <laughs> <That's right>. <laughs> <laughs> We're both from German background, so <laughs> I try and get schnitzel in wherever I can. So. <laughs> that's gonna be a that's a winner right there. <laughs> fiber schnitzel. <laughs> Excellent. I'm gonna give that a go. Um, there you go. Especially so, with the uh, almond meal, that'll be good. Yeah. Um, okay. Well, that's great um, and very helpful. So, and just to kind of get back to the herbs, you know, we've talked about uh, garlic and Alice, um, the Ali Shore extract and all that to be really super effective on methanogens. Um, do you have, in your experience, <laughs> any other herbs that you found really helpful other than, you know, we, there's some... Uh, hit and miss with essential oils and uh, which can be in conjunction with garlic really helpful for methane dominance um yeah. anything else that you found really helpful in the past i i would say um and i don't know if this was <laughs> a fluke but i have had a few patients in the past where quite a high dose of bactrex seemed to get rid of the methanobacter mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. the go figure <laughs> i don't mm-hmm. know but it did, it did work, and it was happening quite successfully for a while, and then I haven't seen that for, for quite some time now. Um, we are experimenting heavily as we speak with a trantle, which I know that yeah. you've talked to um, Alison Seebecker about. Uh, mm-hmm. I think you did a podcast. I, I didn't hear it, but I, I, I don't know if that's been aired yet. It's been but aired, certainly... and it's. Uh, I am having my patients uh, try it, so I'm a lot more open to it now that she has heavily endorsed a trantile. Yes. <laughs> so yeah, I'm very curious because I have some absolutely very difficult patients, scleroderma, mm-hmm. uh, you know, obstructions and things like that. So we're reacting to everything and we can't get the methane down. Lots of regurgitation, lots of burping. Yep. Uh, so I'm curious to hear what your, resu- what your results will be. With yeah, that. so far, and, and, and I can say this, we've been doing it for maybe couple of months now and uh, both Natalie my partner um, who sees quite a lot of patients with SIBO as well we we've noticed that it does have quite a significant effect on on gas in general and and patients tend to report that they their abdomen just feels better mm. so mm-hmm. that's I can certainly you know testify to that at this point um, it also possibly is helping with move bowels but I'm not sure about that yet Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's early yeah. days for me as well. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, and you know, just actually that reminded me of uh, just to mention about constipation and methane. We know that meth, especially if it's not a SIBO type of methane, where we see methane high throughout, 
anything that you do to move the bowels will reduce methane. Methane is high because people are constipated and backed up. Yep. You know, so yep. we know that cascara or whatever um, laxative you use will reduce methane because you're actually removing the actual bug like that. So mm -hmm. that's just a word about that, you know, also to consider when you do a retest potentially to make sure that your patient really is moving their bowels, you know? So, because if a patient is constipated three days before the test, uh, for the long time, for three whole days, that might actually impact the test of somebody who has high methane all the way throughout. Yeah. And for those listening about that, actually, that's an important point for testing. You don't have to do the whole test. You can just do a methane spot test for those that are high methane all the way throughout. So again, not a SIBO case, but more an IBSC case. And you're comparing then just um, a regular SIBO test you're treating, and then you're just having your patient do one tube without a substrate um, in the morning, um, maybe three or four weeks into treatment. And what you're doing is you're comparing baseline to baseline. If your baseline hasn't changed much, it's high, but it hasn't changed much throughout, then that's a very good candidate for a methane spot test, and they're a lot cheaper than a regular um, no, methane, as, I mean, a regular lactulose breath test. Good to know. Mm. So, no, but really only that. reserved for uh, those that have high baseline that stays high throughout without a change of 12 parts per million in methane. And request that from your labs if you're listening from overseas. Um, but we certainly do offer that. Um, and that's, that's a, good, a good tip. You don't have to go through the entire um, three-hour breath testing. Mm, okay. Now, let's kind of talk about... Uh, pomegranate because as i've mentioned yeah. in the intro i remember like i think it was two years ago you were just you made an offhand comment have you tried pomegranate and i hadn't at the time and so mm -hmm. you've been experimenting with it a lot longer than i have i've like i said i've maybe been doing it for about i think it's maybe been a lot you know time flies now that I'm almost 50. So, you know, it's like, I don't know what happened to the last five years. It's just flown by. So it could, could be longer than a year, but it's, yeah. it seems like, I mean, I'm only really using it for those that are failing berberine yep. um, in terms of hydrogen uh, dominant SIBO. But I'm curious to see what you have to say about pomegranate, how you're using it, how often are you using it? and what your um, results are with that. Yeah. So that my kind of quest to find agents that would work for patients, um, I, I remember hearing a, a lecture from Jason Horlick, who um, was at the, presenting at the last SIBO symposium, and uh, he's, he's done quite a lot of work uh, or looking at the research that's on pomegranate, which is used in uh, certainly in Chinese medicine, and I, I did know about it through my background in studying Chinese medicine, but also Ayurvedic medicine, um, use it as a anti anti parasitic, antibacterial. Um, it's 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 in a lot of formulas uh, for the traveler's diarrhea, uh, those sorts of things. So I started looking into it, and and it was almost impossible to get. You could buy it as in a powdered form at some of the um, uh, as a simple um, in some of the Chinese um, medicine. Uh, distributors they had it in powdered form so but it's it's fairly intense herb um, and so I, I didn't really want to do that and make my own capsules a bit fiddly so I found out that Jason had been making that in Tasmania and um, so he makes his own tinctures and so I was down there doing some traveling and <laughs> bought a couple of bottles to try and experiment with Anyway, I started using them for um, my patients, uh, particularly the ones that, um, as you know, with I think with berberine, both berberine and Bactrex, which are two of the ones that I commonly go to to start with uh, treating the hydrogen dominant SIBO, um, can be quite irritating to some patients. Mm -hmm. um, and it's you know it, again, it's hit and miss who who reacts and who doesn't. So, but they, it is common for those two to cause. Lots of different symptoms. Diarrhea is a really common one that I've found in my practice. So I'm always looking for more gentle options. But um, so I started, I got two two half liters of, uh, of this pomegranate, but it was the pure rind uh, in a tincture form. Um, and I started using that in combination with 
um, golden seal and some other things in a in a. Um, but I actually used it as a simple for a while and just wanted to see what that would do. And sure enough, it was bringing down uh, hydrogen. And so I, I had been using it more, but then I ran out of the stuff, the gold that I got from him. And I had uh, I have a friend in Hobart who had sent me a couple of bottles as well. And um, But that was going to get a bit tiring because I was starting to use quite a lot of it. <clears throat> so anyway, I stopped using it because it was just impractical for me to be getting this. And then... Uh, about a year ago, I think it was one of the. Uh, I think it was Optimal mm-hmm. Remedies Optimal came out RX, with yeah. Mm-hmm. RX. Yeah, uh, came out with a pomegranate extract and in an alcohol base, but it wasn't. Um, and there are other products that you can get on the market. Uh, Pomelo was one of them, which but it's usually a combination of the rind and the seed and the pulp. So I, I started experimenting with that, and I. I I haven't been as excited by the results of it. I do still use it, but uh, it's not something that I, I – the, the stuff that I got from Jason just seemed to be uh, mm. much more potent as an antimicrobial broad spectrum. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I often use it uh, – I mean, my experience with it has been mainly with protozoan infections. You know, I've, mm-hmm. I used a lot of the Coptis pomegranate combo yep. – uh, and now that Optimal also carries Coptis, I um, a, 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 sort of a one-to-one or so of a yep. pomegranate Coptis is, is, I mean, with protozoans, it's it's difficult to treat those, uh, Blastocystis hominis and Diantamoeba fragilis, um, but they, they do um, seem to respond fairly well. But I do use pomegranate um, in a combination tincture quite a bit for... Uh, uh, for SIBO and those again like you mentioned when they're very sensitive but very sensitive patients are very tricky because if they re- react to backtracks and for those of, for those listeners who are unfamiliar with that product um, it is uh, philodendron which is a berberine containing herb clove oil oregano oil and thyme oil in essential oils and we've been using that here in Australia quite a f- quite effectively for uh, for hydrogen dominant SIBO and the equivalent I guess would be it's a very different formula but what Dr. Mullen has with candibactin AR and BR sort of those types of responses we are seeing with hydrogen dominance so that's just a clarification on Bactrex but yeah pomegranate I use that often with um, usnea or horopito and you know in terms of also SIBO CIFO kind of stuff but pomegranate yeah. has this really um, it's very specific for specific types of E. coli and Klebsiella, so I also use it for when I find those um, species in overgrowth on a CDSA, so it's not yeah. just for that. And I think Nutrition Care has made a capsule or a tablet. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. Uh, and I have yet to really dive into using that a lot because I just usually use tincture mixes, but... Um, okay, so that's good to know that you have seen um, really good results with a different, I mean, I know that Jason usually makes turbocharged kind of tinctures <laughs> down there because I, I bought like a Coptis tincture when it was hard to find. Again, Coptis yeah. is another berberine containing herb. Yeah. And it was like, oh, my God, it would just take the peel off, like the paint off your car if you put it <laughs> accidentally dropped it on there. And it was really super strong. And yeah. Yeah, yeah, he has some magic in the Tasmanian uh, <laughs> air so, down there. Yeah. Um, so, yes, very good. But it was quite expensive. But anyways, yeah. just, so moving yeah. on, uh, you know, let's talk about because you you and I agree on something. And this ties back to sort of the constipation and retraining and desensitizing patients uh, to FODMAP foods. And I don't know if desensitization is the right term for this because what we're talking about is you have a patient on a low FODMAP diet for the duration of the biphasic diet. And I've always said, you know, there really should be a phase three to the biphasic diet in which you start to reintroduce um, these uh, these FODMAPs. And because FODMAPs are fibers that don't just feed the bacteria in the small intestine where they're not supposed to be, but really are very beneficial to the large intestine and its population there and depriving them of those types of FODMAPs for a long time is theoretically an issue 
Now, there is controversy around that. I know Norm Robillard, I read an article recently where he really uh, disputes that, where he says you get plenty of fiber to feed your microbiome without FODMAPs, which, you know, I think the jury's out. I feel better the more diverse my patient's diet is, and the sooner I introduce foods without reactions, the better. So let me know, or tell me what your take on this is and what your experience has been with that. Mm. So I, I, it's an interesting topic for me because I think it's it's something I've certainly mentioned to you before. And for those patients who have, and and this is the you know the, this is the kind of patient you all want, where they you know they test positive for SIBO, it explains a lot of their symptoms. You do the treatment, it all goes well. They're able to tolerate all the antimicrobials that you give them, and are happy to do the the biophasic diet for whatever period needs to be done. They do a follow-up test and it comes back as a normal test. And so then my question was, what do we do then? Because I, I always thought it's interesting. SIBO is, to, to find out that they've got SIBO has been such a, um, um, a wonderful thing for so many patients who have gone through, and I'm sure you've experienced this before, where they've been you know, looking for, for answers for five years, gone and done or every medical test you know, cameras at both ends and, and nothing, and they've just been told that it's either all in their head or, you know, there's nothing wrong with you. And so finally to have an answer that can <clears throat> not only explain some of their symptoms but also give a direction of treatment, I think, um, is wonderful. But I, I always had this idea, and I, I, I like to think about trying to get back to the cause wherever I can in my practice. And so it's interesting that they've got SIBO, but the question should always be, why do they have SIBO? And um, I, I do try to spend a lot of time trying to understand how that happened for that patient and try to restore some of the imbalances that had occurred that, to allow SIBO to manifest in the first place. And I think the other thing that's interesting to me is that, I, I and I don't know how correct this is, but this is my understanding at this point, that the, the toxicity of those gases that are produced in the small bowel, which is a tissue that shouldn't really have those bacteria at those levels there producing gas, being totally different structurally to the large bowel. The, the damage that's done uh, to the villi and the microvilli will affect their secretory function, which then has an effect on their ability to absorb um, certain sugars and this is where the FODMAP stuff comes into it. So I, I, I've not in my practice seen anyone who I think was born with FODMAP intolerances. So in most cases, to my, mm. to my knowledge, it's something that's acquired. And my typical patient, um, even though I have tested someone at six years old and found um, you know, that, that they have both SIBO and FODMAP intolerances, most of my patients are, I would say, between 20 and 40, typically. And a lot of them were asymptomatic until they finished high school and started traveling. And so a lot of them have gone overseas, gotten some sort of, or, or even in, in, you know, within Melbourne had um, got some sort of episode of gastro. And from that point on have never been well. And, um, you know, they're finally, they head down the path of the breath testing and find that they have multiple FODMAP intolerances. They go along to one of the, you know, Shepherd Works or other uh, clinics that, um, where they, you know, the diet, dietitians are training them on what foods to avoid, and they're told to go away. And uh, it's usually quite a significant improvement in some of their symptoms, usually around 70% on average. And then they keep going, and things don't seem to improve anymore, and may even go backwards after that point. So I started thinking about, well, what is it that's going on? What what dysfunction happens to allow, you know, those sugars to not be absorbed? And so I, I I'm now convinced that the toxicity from the gases in from the bacteria that shouldn't be there in the small intestine creates damage to the wall of the bowel, the small intestine, not the large bowel. And um, that destruction, you know, or the atrophy to the villi or whatever happens um, can be reversed. And I, 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 when I first saw this, I had a patient, and this was about four years ago, and we hadn't had any knowledge of the biphasic diet, but we did a lot of antimicrobial work and her symptoms had improved dramatically. And, I, I, and then we started doing some repair work, um, just trying to heal the leaky gut, um, improve you know, um, the balance of bacteria in the large bowel. And, and this took months. But over that time, um, you know, her tolerances for things that she was previously intolerant for became um, improved. And 
to the point now where I've had quite a lot of patients that have gone through and it does take months, but those patients who do the repair work afterwards, and we'll have a little chat about this, <laughs> what I do afterwards, because I think it's quite interesting and for other practitioners out there, would be curious to find out what they do. But certainly I find it as, is probably just as important as treating SIBO as doing the repair work afterwards because I know SIBO has a high relapse rate and I was surprised to hear the... The, the, that, that some of the patients were, you know, relapsing within, you know, within a month to two months of treatment. And certainly what I've found in my practice is that that is not the case. And certainly there are some patients who, you know, fall off and don't continue doing the repair phase. But those that do, I would say, overwhelmingly don't have the relapses that um, I hear about from, you know, overseas in particular. So I don't know what they're doing after they get rid of the SIBO. Um, but certainly... Uh, I found in my practice that a lot of um, a lot of certainly the FODMAP intolerances. I've got patients who are now eating garlic and onion, who that would have been unthinkable years ago. Um, apples, watermelon, all of those foods that were, you know, almost like toxic to them before that. Um, yeah, so it's been very interesting, and so I would suggest that it is possible by changing the functioning and the structure of the small intestine and balancing the large bowel to actually reverse some of those uh, FODMAP intolerances, if not all of them. Yeah, and I completely agree with that, and I certainly see that in my practice. I mean, we know that SIBO causes leaky gut, and it's one of the only conditions in which zonulin is released, and so therefore causing leaky gut. And not just that, but the damage to the brush border enzymes and the brush border itself by the gases, as you've mentioned, is certainly a key feature in many, many SIBO cases. And I often do a repair phase. It's just that I do it sort of reverse because I find that by doing it first um, and actually not doing antimicrobials, that was the, the whole basis of the biphasic diet. And, and it can extend to however long people need to do it. But the phase, first phase is really about repairing and introducing substances that will help to decrease inflammation and um, get, the, get the gut ready for the antimicrobial load that's going to come its way. But I'm certainly curious to hear what you are using after. So what you're saying is you do the biphasic protocol, you use the antimicrobials, and then you follow that up with the repair phase. That's correct. Yeah, okay. I've never done it the other way. <laughs> yeah. And, and what you know, what I find is like once that's like, I do get also very similar results to what you're saying, but those, like if I have, like I think the chronic relapsers um, are those, a lot of those, you know, Ehlers-Danlos, uh, scleroderma, those, and obstruction. I have a patient that has um, uh, malrotation of the small intestine. Those are the ones where we really yep. would expect you need to put them on a management plan, you know. Um, but yes, I agree. Those just that have run-of-the-mill SIBO um, are easier to stop from relapsing, although there is this component of the migrating motor complex. So I'm really curious to hear what you're doing and how you're addressing that component. Yeah. So I, I think um, one, of the, one of the main things that I've uh, found incredibly useful in my clinic is quite high-dose zinc. And I, I want to, yeah, I, I think that it does a number of things. The other thing that um, I know that you've, you've had other, you did another podcast on uh, candidiasis and... Mm -hmm. um, so my main treatment for candidiasis in my clinic is also very high dose zinc, and it just works brilliantly. So I usually put my patients on, um, uh, I, you know, and and this is I'm I'm generalising here, so I, they're all different, but for the most part, I find um, minerals in general are very useful, but also uh, particularly zinc, and and zinc, you know, works on anything to do with mucous membrane. It's that first line defence, um, and so. There, there's also research to show that zinc alone can repair leaky gut, which I found fascinating when I first discovered that. Um, so we know, you know, most people using glutamine and, and, and often zinc is included there to some degree, but I usually go quite high dose and I'm usually using either, probably it, it depends on the case and, and, and sensitivity and other factors, but usually around 60 to 90 milligrams for a couple of weeks to start with. And what type of zinc? Uh, I use the um, bisglycinate, so it's a um, the Biomedica Biocozinc, oh, which has magnesium in it as well. And so, is this um, so bisglycinate? Do you see 
I mean, many of my patients just get too nauseous with zinc. Do you get that yeah. with the bisglycinate as well? Not at all. No. Interesting. No. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, and you know, those that can tolerate it on an empty stomach, I, it's my preference to do it that way. So I usually give one at the bookends of the day. But for those who do find it a little bit, you know, um, nauseating, it's not, not common, though. Um, I'll usually just get them to take it with food. And, uh, yeah. So, mm -hmm. okay, great. Yeah, so, so that's one mm -hmm. of the main things. The other thing is also, you know, as I said to you, we, I do focus a lot on the large intestine and, um, and that's, that's certainly a big part. And I, I have actually used my, my thinking is on this is I, I had done a lot of CDSAs in the past and, um, I don't, I find some of the digestive markers and certainly the parasitology component, um, interesting clinically, but the, I remember hearing Jason talk about this as well, about the usefulness of um, culturing um, microbes from poo. And, you know, that certain species, certain, you know, um, microbes will, will certainly grow um, in, in that whatever medium it is that they're using, um, whereas a whole lot, and in fact, the significant majority don't culture well. So that, that got me thinking about the approach to that and, and how useful it is to know that, you know, someone had... <clears throat> which I'm not sure is, is actually possible to have no growth lactobacilli or bifido in a, in a CDSA. But what I did find useful from that information, and I use it as a general indicator that, you know, the balance isn't right. And so rather than continuing to control that environment, my approach is now to try and respect that environment a little bit more and um, to use certainly in, in, in that. I mean, there's no question in my mind that, you know, most patients with SIBO have significant levels of dysbiosis in the large bowel, um, not only as a result of the treatment of SIBO, but also <laughs> having had SIBO for such a long time. Um, and my, my thinking on that is that if you've got a, a, a flourishing, healthy ecosystem, then it doesn't matter if there are a few weeds in there. But what, what I do now is, is the approach is, is very much about trying to rotate um, prebiotics, which I know, you know, certainly people with SIBO, but I'm talking about those who have recovered from, mm -hmm. you know, having large overgrowth. So mm -hmm. there's no, you know, and, and this, is, this is, there's always a balance to be had, and this is done, you know, with, with starting very low dose. And I, my, my uh, approach now is to actually uh, rotate um, a range of different prebiotics and uh, and also uh, focus on increasing fiber um, which is something that obviously is is lacking in in the biphasic diet it's hard to get sorry levels that you know that, that help with moving bowels so really it's about you know putting in in the fertilizer a select a number of prebiotics and uh, and obviously this is based on tolerance as well and I start very low <laughs> And I do use lactulose as well because also for those patients, it, it does help move the bowel very well, but also helps grow significantly uh, both lactobacilli and bifido. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I'm starting to use um, a galactigo oligosaccharide, um, which I've um, also found out about through Jason, which is mm -hmm. Bimino, which I get in from the yeah. UK. Yep. So, mm -hmm. um, again, you know, low dose and, and, you know, obviously there's, there's different degrees of tolerance for these things. And, um, I know that, you know, some of these can't be used if, if those FODMAP intolerances are, are still present. And this is certainly something that I take, you know, some people are okay to start with at the beginning and, and for others, we need to do more of the, the repairing before we start introducing some of these. But, um, I do also, um, use some of, so I'm, I'm, my, my regime is really about trying to increase the diversity of fibers. So we use soluble and insoluble fibers. Um, I do use prebiotics and selectively use probiotics, but my preference is these days, unless there are obvious signs or conditions to, um, to use this fiber approach more than trying to replenish um, bacterial colonies through uh, ingestion. So, but I do use a lot of probiotics, having mm. said that. So yeah. just to recap, then, your main approach to the repair phase is the high yeah. dose zinc, the prebiotics and a range of soluble and insoluble fibers. Yes. And colonic foods as well. Um, I use uh, quite a lot of green tea in my practice. Um, I have used it in capsule form, but if people can make it, it's better. Um, mm -hmm. 
so I, I train them how to make a good pot of green tea. Um, and with the plunger. The same, yeah, with the plunger or a pot. <laughs> yes. yeah. But also to use the same, you know, the, the green mm-hmm. tea that they – absolutely no exception has to be organic. Um, there's been quite a bit of issue – or quite there have been documented issues mm-hmm. with using, you, you know, um, non-organic forms of green tea from China. And what are you um, using the green tea for, for listeners? Yeah, so as, as a colonic food, in its own right, so it will grow bacteria, but also with the high polyphenols. It's, yeah, it the is polyphenols. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. It's and, kind of uh, like a mixed bag, though. You know, a lot of people can't tolerate green tea, in my experience. So yeah, it, yeah. Uh, maybe the capsules are a little bit different in that regard. Yeah, and usually one capsule is enough um, to get the you know the amount of the polyphenols that we mm-hmm. need. So, but these are things that you know, I'm talking in general terms. But I, I obviously there are you know individual susceptibilities in in here as well. The other thing that I use on Almost all my patients who have constipation is that seed mix that I mentioned to you earlier mm-hmm. with the, um, you know, the cheer and, and the all the other The fiber schnitzel. The fiber schnitzel. So I'm all about fiber, yeah. really. I, mm. I found it really interesting that mm. um, when, they, when they did studies on, um, you know, the, the diversity of bacteria in the large intestine of, you know, those communities that still practice a traditional hunter-gatherer lifestyle. And there was, I think, you know, roughly it was something like 3,000 individual um, uh, species that had been um, documented and the average westerner um, is down to about a thousand so mm-hmm. that's two-thirds of the ecosystem has been decimated yeah by our western I've lifestyle. yeah I talk a lot about that in mm-hmm. in other podcasts where I think you know you and I and other practitioners listening to this podcast we are at the coal phase of a time in human uh, life or in, in human experience that we've never witnessed before. We actually don't know uh, what's going to happen with this type yeah. of assault on the microbiome. And totally. Jason did mention <laughs> that at the SIBO Summit. And, for, you know, we, we Jason keeps coming up in different talks. But for yeah. those of you listening, um, it's a great talk from the SIBO Summit 2016 available on the SIBO uh, test website. You can purchase it. It's an hour I think it's an hour and a half um, on pre and probiotics, and he talks about the loss of species diversity, which is so absolutely crucial. In and then we, we, as we're finding out more, it's just the same with the rainforest. As we're chopping it down, we're finding out more and more about different species. Same with microbiome. The more we're chopping it down, the more we're finding out about physiological functions that are um, detrimental to human existence on this planet so it's a really really interesting time to be a practitioner focusing on uh, digestive disorders let's put it Mm. that way but just to also mention i want to just have a couple of comments on what you said i'm really interested about the zinc because i i use zinc and vitamin a routinely in my repair program yeah um uh, and a higher dose uh, vitamin a Uh, so zinc and vitamin a very good research on um also leaky gut. So, but I, I'm, I'm going to use higher doses. I think I've, yeah. I usually stuck around 60. I might go up to 90. Yeah. Um, the bimuno that you mentioned, which is yeah. the galacto oligosaccharide, is a yes. different galacto oligosaccharide that we usually see. It has see been in modified. Yep. Yeah. So, and it's specific, well, at least on their website, you can find it, bimuno.com. It's uh, uh, B I M U N O. And it is a great product. It uh, increases bifidobacterium specifically, and galacto oligosaccharides yep. are fibers, prebiotic fibers that are found in breast milk for the sole purpose of feeding bifidobacterium species in the infant. So yep. it's a it's a great product. Uh, lactulose, just a word of caution, that's contraindicated for those that have a rise. Um, of hydrogen on a lactulose breath test, but are very good for those that are negative on a lactulose breath test, but positive on other breath testing in terms of yeah. either glucose or fructose. So, um, yeah, I just wanted to kind of put that in there. Yes, it's a good point. And mm. I, I am cautious with my use of all of these. So, mm. um, yeah, I, I don't routinely just go through them. Um, mm. There is some <laughs> method to the madness. Mm. Yeah, Great. so it is a good point to make. Um, yeah. Great. Well, excellent. Look, this has been really fantastic. I think there's a lot of clinical pearls here. Um, I just want to also mention to listeners that on SIBOTest.com, we do have a, a page for patients called Retraining a Sluggish Bowel, where we talk about some of the 
uh, sort of other issues like meditation and exercise and those kinds of what I call no-brainers, but there's some very good links to uh, breathing exercises and the talk that Dr. Datis Karazian did, uh, who is a functional neurologist. He's a, he's a chiropractor, but he, he teaches about functional neurology and he talks about certain exercises to stimulate the vagus nerve that to uh, re-stimulate peristaltic action in those patients. And I have varying degrees of success with those, but those links are there for you to peruse and have yeah. a look at. Um, sometimes the breathing exercises, which was, I just found that by accident, it was Nadia Andriva um, on, she did a TED talk, which was only like five minutes. And she did this very, very vigorous um, breathing exercises that work like really well for some of my patients. And it's just a manual, uh, well, let's just say that breathing is such an important aspect of moving the diaphragm up and down, which of course causes a massaging of the transverse colon. And sometimes that is all that's needed because people aren't breathing properly. So there's a lot here. I think we just touched the, the surface of, uh, you know, uh, constipation and what to do, but I really, really appreciate your insights and we'll try some of the things you, you said. Do you have any other sort of little pearls to <laughs> throw in at the end? Um, I'm not sure that I do, but I, I, I would say that I do find that treating the diaphragm is critical and what stops the diaphragm from moving is often stress. People mm -hmm. tighten up. So stress is a massive factor in bowels not moving. And um, the other thing that I've noticed in my practice is that I would say the overwhelming majority of my patients who present with SIBO have anxiety issues. Mm -hmm. And I spend a lot of time. And one of the other reasons that I use a lot of zinc and a lot of B6 and also magnesium in the repair phase and also during is that um, those uh, very, very useful in treating uh, patients with anxiety, and particularly those who also present uh, do, um, or have, you know, in their history. We, I do a lot of testing for pyroluria, mm. and um, I do use those. Uh, I mean, th those those three are, are absolutely critical for manufacturing of all neurotransmitters. And given that serotonin has such a massive impact on gut motility as well, you know, ninety percent of serotonin is resides in the in the bowel wall so i i yeah zinc b6 mm. and magnesium and mm -hmm. all day <laughs> <laughs> good excellent well thank you so much chris gebhardt for your participation Pleasure. in the SIBO doctor podcast where can people find you you know where well, what's where's your yep. website i know that we're going to have all of the links on the yep. podcast page yep. but uh, the random patient that's listening to this Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, we practice in, in Melbourne um, in a suburb called Ashburton. And um, if you want to find out a little bit about us, you can call us or check out the website. There's a bit of info on us. Um, and the website is www.resonancetherapy.com.au. And both my partner, Natalie, and myself, we specialize in gut health and uh, amongst other things. But that's, that's our particular area of interest and focus. Yeah. Yeah, you're definitely our naturopathic SIBO superstars in Melbourne. So <laughs> I'll, I'll always think about your fiber schnitzel from now yeah. on, Chris. Can't wait for to I'm actually for... offering schnitzel tonight. So. <laughs> Excellent. Great. Well, thank you so much. And yeah, I'm welcome. sure you'll be on the program again at some time in the future. Thanks a Excellent. lot, Chris. Have a good day. Bye. Thank you for listening to the SIBO Doctor Podcast. We hope you found the information in this episode useful in the treatment of your SIBO patients. Head over to our sponsor, SIBOtest.com, an online testing service for your patients and home of the Practitioner Education Portal. Tune in again for another episode of the SIBO Doctor Podcast. Thanks again for listening. Thank you.